Hello, beautiful light-filled souls. I'm so happy to be here with Kelvin Chen, and he has been a meditation teacher for almost 40 years now. Just lots of deep information that we're going to dive into in this call and talk about people's fear of death, and I think it'll be an interesting conversation between a near-death experiencer and someone who has been focused on this topic for a while and really been dealing with people's people's fears and easing those fears for quite some time. Um, he has a book out called Overcoming the Fear of Death, and you can find him at kelvinshen.org. I also thank you so much for all of you who've been in contact with me and have sent me the private emails and messages about my book, Angels in the OR. I have loved connecting with you, and it just warms my heart to be connected with people all over this planet and to to feel your interest in this topic. And thank you for watching these videos and thank you for support of my poetry book too. Some of you asked um, about my poetry and I just self-published a short book called The Self, The Other and God and kind of meditative reflections on the journey we have with ourselves, with others and with God. But I'm excited to delve into this conversation with you. And um, one thing that I've heard you say, Kelvin, which I really like a lot, is you demystify the mystical and put that in plain terms for people so that anyone feels comfortable with these experiences. Could you tell me a little bit more about your style? Yeah, exactly. That's my thing. I, I try to demystify the mystical, as you say, just because I think if we take a lot of the mystery out of it, I think it'd be more accessible to more people. I think people kind of get a little bit um, uh, like overwhelmed sometimes by some of the terminology, et cetera. And I think we can explain things in basic subject, verb, object sentences without too much uh, big, big words. And so that my whole goal and everything I do with my nonprofits is to try to, re try to reach and help as many people around the world as possible just like you. And, and, and I'm, so far, it's like 33 countries, all different religions. People can be very religious or very not religious. They could be agnostic, atheists, uh, atheists. So they could be, um, uh, you know, every, every organized, every group of religious uh, organizations around the world I've helped. So I try to make everything that I say easily understandable and also non-cultural and non-religious. I love that. And I, as I heard you speaking, I thought about how you had experience in the corporate world and so many different places. And in our culture in America, people are very time stressed and very, you know, just overwhelmed. And I thought demystifying it, they don't have time to get into the esoteric, yeah. you know, like language of it. They really just want practical tips to make their lives better and to access greater peace. And it sounds like you're able to do that for people who would normally gravitate towards spirituality. Yeah, that's the idea. And like you said, I have this, you know, I was in the corporate world for, you know, 30 plus years and I've been teaching meditation for, this is the 47th year I've been teaching meditation. I've been meditating for almost 50, this is my 50th year meditating. And so even with my corporate work that I did, um, you know, raising a family and two kids and so forth, um, I was teaching meditation on the side. And so I taught it full time. And when I was in my 20s, now I'm teaching it full time again, I'm doing the fear of death work, et cetera, and the um, afterlife work now um, full time in the last six, seven years. So, um, but yeah, I, I marry up, I, I can talk about things with business people or with people who are very steeped in the spiritual world as well. So I kind of traverse the whole range. Yeah, I get that. And um, then you're kind of a commercial for meditation because one wouldn't guess your age <laughs> when you, you put it in. <laughs> that way. I, I, I look younger than I am as well. And so I always tell my students when I talk about meditation, I'm like, one reason to meditate, it does slow down the aging process it, a bit. <laughs> it literally does. I mean, people don't realize that I'm 400 years old this lifetime, you know, <laughs> but uh no, seriously, I just had a birthday last week, and uh, and I'm I'm pushing seventy, so it's like, I'm you know, and uh, and uh, um, yet I still feel and act like I, sometimes I act like I'm still twenty seven, but I feel like I'm twenty seven still. <laughs> it's really funny. They did do a study at Harvard 
in the 1990s on the, the, the med, uh, meditation technique style that I do, which is very easy and so forth. And they found that actually, like, let's see, they get this right. The calendar age, the calendar age, the physiologic age, the physical age was on the average 11 to 12 years younger than their calendar age of the people. And they'd only been doing this technique for three, four, five years. Oh, wow. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. That, that benefits go that deep. All right. So one of my questions, and this we're going to dive right into um, some deeper stuff, is I was listening to you and I've heard other mediums say this. And then during my near-death experience, this was my experience as well. I saw the light beings, which I called angels, working on my body in this reality. So they were interacting with this reality right now. And one thing that you've said about death is that it's right here. So, you know, we're just not in the physical body, but we are in that place. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think I say sometimes there's less difference between here and there than we realize. And I mean by that, from a mental slash emotional standpoint, obviously, physically, it's very different. We don't have physical bodies and fluids, and all that kind of stuff. But I think uh, one perspective is looking at it uh, as less different from a mental slash emotional standpoint. Um, uh, it, looking through that filter uh, really helps us understand more about the other side. Um, and the other thing is, it's like you say, it's, there's, 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 there's not, it's not so far, there's no distance really between here and there. It is right here. We just can't see it. Maybe it's, we could say um, in our language, we would say that it's, operating at a different frequency, a different vibration, whatever, but it's right here. And so when you have, like you said, light beings, angels, whatever you want to call them, working on your physical body uh, when you had your NDE, I mean, they're right here. It's like we just, you know, sometimes people can see them. I've had experiences where I can see uh, light, light beings, bodies of people, et cetera, et cetera, vibrationally, et cetera. But, but other times, you know, you, you can't, I don't see them all the time. And, and, and most people cannot see them. So they are here um, in and amongst us, and, or you could say vice versa, we are in and amongst them as well. But um, this, it, there's, no, there's not so much distance as we say, you know. Yeah, and, and yet there's a lot to explore too. So, you know, one part of my near-death experience, I felt like I was in the cosmos and many times I've connected with my dad and he seemed to really love exploring outer space and, you know, the galaxies and all that there is to explore. So there's, yeah. there's that element too. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's definitely a reality to that different, I, I describe it as a different experience of time and space also on the other side. Um, uh, there's a vastness, et cetera. You could describe it like, like your dad's kind of uh, alluding to. Um, and at the same time, um, there is a, there's a, there's a, there's a structural reality to it. There's a structure to that reality, just like there's a structure here. Um, we have physical objects, we have bodies that are dense, you know, physical objects and so forth over there, not so much. And in time, uh, for example, uh, people often say when they have an NDE or a spiritually transformative experience, you know, the STE acronym, either way, people will, will often say, well, I was in this place and, and it, it seemed timeless. There was no time there. there. Time didn't exist. And I understand when they say that, but really that's not accurate. I mean, it, it, it's figuratively speaking, you feel like it's timeless and it feels like there's no time and feels like time stood still. But time is a measurement of change, and change is still existing on the other side. It's just a different experience of change, different rate of change than here. So I get it why people say it, but it's not, it's not technically accurate, you know? Yeah, and I heard in your video you gave a great example, and maybe you want to share that here, of how if you died, you could be near both of your kids almost within a split second, and they might assume that you were talking to them at the same time. Exactly. Yeah, I think there's a, it's understandable why people um, uh, may say, oh, it seems like you can be in two places at the same time. I understand why, because you think about it. If, if in fact, we do, and my experience, your experience, but, but maybe not everybody who's listening and watching has had the actual experience, but so we'll just pose it as an if. You know, let's say we do continue 
after we physically die, our mind, soul, spirit, consciousness, whatever, I use those all synonymously, continues after we physically die. What is continuing? Well, it's not our physical body, as we say, but so it's our mind or soul or spirit or consciousness, it's energy. So our energy is continuing. So if we think of it that way, um, what is also energy is light. Light is energy on this side, and we know the speed of light. And I actually was giving a lecture and I Googled it to figure out exactly how fast the speed of light was. And it's, it's like 670 million miles per hour plus whatever, you know. Uh, and, and so it's around 700 million miles per hour. That's the speed of light. And so then I give a quick uh, example. I say, okay, well, what does that mean? That's, that means you could get around the planet in, in eight times in one second. You can get around the, the equator of Earth in eight times in one second, one eighth of a second to get around the Earth. That means so that I, the example to you were pointing out, I, I give the example of people sometimes that say, well, you know, maybe you have had or you've talked to a psychic or you talked to somebody who's died and they've had this experience on the other side where it seems like they're in two places at the same time. Well, imagine on Earth, if my son was in Tokyo acting, my son's an actor, my daughter's a model, and, um, and so she's working for Wilhelmina in London or Paris or someplace, and I go, and I'm dead, and I go visit my son, and I talk to my son, I love you, blah, 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 and then they, you know, I, then I go talk to my daughter, and then they call each other up right away on Earth time, and they say, Daddy just talked to me, Daddy just talked to me, he says, yeah, we must be able to be in two places at the same time. Well, to get from Tokyo to Paris, it, t- it just took me less than a quarter of a second if, I'm, if I can travel at the speed of light. So then you could see how somebody could take that understandably and say, oh yeah, you could be at two places at the same time. Not exactly, I don't think. Yeah, and time is a, uh, a measurement that we made up, but you know, as you were talking about in that video, it's, it's interesting, I've, I've grappled with this and so we're jumping right into it, which I guess we're meant to. That's fine. In, in my communications with my father, because when he was, I was with him a few moments before he died and I left and then he died, but he telepathically sent me because he could no longer talk at that moment. And he sent me this message and he said, see you soon, kiddo. <laughs> and I was like, not that soon, dad. <laughs> <You know? laughs> exactly. And, and yet I think he was beginning to merge with the eternal already and was yeah. beginning to feel the other side. And to him, time seems like he'll see me soon you know it it doesn't seem like that and it might be you know a long while but to him it seems soon and yeah yeah what is the experience of how time is experienced over there what do you think well that's exactly right and it's very different and um so one example i give is this is the is the speed of light example you think about it you know you could travel the speed of light I mean, I'd say, you know, and people will say to me, well, how do you know it's exactly the speed of light? I don't know. Let's say you can only travel half the speed of light. Oh, you can only go 350 million miles per hour? Oh, excuse me, you know. But I think we can travel, my experience on the other side is that, is that we can travel really fast. I don't know how fast we're traveling on this side, but I know from experience it's very, very fast. The other thing is, um, to your point about, you know, he says, like, see you soon, like, what's soon on the other side? Um, I had a, well, I have a friend whose, whose, whose brother dies. I mentioned this in the book, the No Smoking in Heaven section. You remember that one? And, 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 and um, I don't know if I mentioned it in that section in the book, but um, he died, I found out afterwards. You know, I didn't know him or, and I didn't know about him other than I knew she had a brother who died. My friend had a brother who died. I didn't know when, I didn't know where, I don't know what circumstances. And he visited me. And um, out of the blue, he just came and visited me. I was alone. I was kind of waking up, you know, that in between, not awake, not dreaming, not sleeping kind of state. And, and, I, and, I, and, and he came and I felt his presence. I knew it was a male for some reason. I just knew it. And he started telling me some messages to give his sister. And then he said two random things. He said, there's no smoking here. Well, that's weird. I never heard that before. <laughs> and there's no smoking here. And then he said, and he showed me a visual of, him and his sister coming out of a San Diego nightclub. He said it was in San Diego. It was at night. I could see the parking lot lit up and they were laughing. And it was around Hotel Circle off of Route 8. I used to live in San Diego, so I know that whole area. But 
I didn't know, uh, he's telling me this. So I knew he was talking about, it. he must have known that I knew that area. Anyway, so I called her up and I said, here's a message from your brother, blah, blah, blah. And he said, no smoking here. What's that about? She said, well, he hated cigarette smoke. He would go around and tell people in bars and everything. He would tick people off, you know, in the 1980s, long before there were no smoking sections to stop smoking. And then, and then I said, what about the coming out of the nightclub in San Diego? She said, that's the last time I saw him alive. And we were, we were laughing coming out of this nightclub. He had just sung karaoke and got a standing ovation. And it was right off of Route 8, Hotel Circle, uh, which I had no idea. And, and, and he lived in San Diego, which I didn't realize either. She had flown there from Phoenix to, to see him. She, he, di he, died, he, he, he died by suicide two weeks later. It was the last time she saw him alive. And so, um, but, but, but later she found his five page handwritten suicide note um, in a box randomly. And in that suicide note, evidently, um, he started the whole thing by saying, I'm going to uh, get in touch with you really soon. I'm gonna let you know I'm okay. So again, to your point soon, what in her case was 16 years later. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not exactly soon. <laughs> yeah, but earth time, you know? 16 years, but soon, I guess, from his perspective. Very, very interesting. Yeah, I love that. And I love those verifiable details that give people that confirmation that they need. That's so important. Right, right. Yeah, no smoking and the San Diego, all of that. Yeah. Yeah, and you bring up some some interesting points about the different states in which we can be contacted by people. There's the dream mm. state, there's the meditative state, and then there's, you know, like mediumship, you might call it, where you right. sense the spirit right here and you're communicating. Right. And you've had different experiences with different people in those states. Could you break that down for me a bit more? Yeah, they, basically, different? yeah, basically I've had it in all of the above and then probably a whole bunch of other, you know, like it, my, I've had it, you know, in the shower, um, driving in the car with the radios not on, um, um, just sitting quietly. I've had it during meditation. And like I just said, lying in bed, you know, waking up, uh, lying down, resting after I meditate. I always rest for a few minutes after I meditate. So I'm just lying there, resting, letting my mind wander, whatever. All of the above, um, you know, um, I've had, we just call them visitations or conversations from some, sometimes they're dead people, either in this case, I did not know the dead person pr previously, or sometimes dead loved ones, dead family members, friends, or whatever. Um, and other times it's angels, archangels I've had communication with and so forth, and others, in other words, who have not, they've not been in physical form before, but you know, they're, they're mental uh, uh, beings. So we're all mental beings. So I'm having the experience, you know, communicating with them. So it's come in all those different various forms, yeah. Yeah, and I think the more people hear that, the more they're open to experiencing it themselves. I think most people who've had a visitation, it's been in the dream state because that's, you know, you're calm and right. you're, you're open in that state. Yes, I think that's very common. I've had that and I think that's very common and I point that out to people to be open. And sometimes if people want to communicate with a dead loved one or I tell them before you go to sleep just kind of put that out there just think that you know put that out there communicate that out there to them and they'll pick it up and then when your barriers are, are lower when you're uh, more open and receptive in other words during your dreaming they may come and, and, and visit you the other thing is um, you know how they come and so it's not always telepathic or hearing a voice or like I said earlier briefly alluded sometimes Sometimes I, I can see the physical form, the energetic form. Um, other times people will describe, I haven't personally had this experience, but I, many of my clients have, where they'll smell the perfume or the, or the uh, cologne or whatever, or even that person's special, unique body odor that that person had that's unique that you know, that will happen sometimes. Or um, feathers, dragonflies, I mean, certain species of birds that that person and you have a connection with. Uh, all of these kinds of ways are also other ways that uh, feathers, just, you know, coins. I have a lot of clients, coins. I have one client, she said, dad, before you die, you know, um, let's do the coin thing, you know, you know, spin coins, but don't do the penny thing because they'd already, you know, done this with other people. 
I, I want quarters. So she, I don't want pennies. So she, so she finds quarters. So she gets quarters. So instead of like the, the degree that most of us see pennies, because people just throw pennies all over the place. It's not worth anything. You know, she gets quarters. So her, her father sends her messages of quarters. That's great. And it makes life so much more magical when we have a special way of communicating. And I've, I've found something that, you know, I communicate just hearing, you know, yeah. the other side and, and yeah. sometimes impressions are impressed into my mind. But I, I'm with friends, two friends, and I was taking a walk with this friend who had a near death experience. And it's always feathers that she gets. And on this walk, just no, out of nowhere, we're finding feathers, you know, little white feathers and feathers yeah, everywhere. Yeah. No birds, but lots of feathers. You know, it's like, how did that happen? You know, exactly. But so, it was her. If I was on that walk by myself, you it would wouldn't have happened. no feathers. Exactly. I'll tell you another. This one just happened to my daughter recently, uh, maybe a couple few weeks ago. She's, as I mentioned, she's a model. So she was researching something on the internet, whatever about modeling and yada yada. Anyway, on her screen, like this much, like a big, big by like takes up like almost her whole computer screen or laptop. Pop, as a pop-up just pops up and it lists the five loved ones and family members who have been communicating with her from the other side regularly. And it, it, it just listed their names. Yeah, it just listed their five names, boom, 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 boom. And the last name of one of them, which is the, her aunt's, uh, uh, her aunt's um, uh, life partner who died, uh, her last name was there and everybody else's first names, including my mother and father. And, um, and then the bottom name was Sam. My daughter's name is Samantha. So it said Sam on the bottom. So it listed the five names of all the, her high school friend, her elementary school friend, her aunt, my mother and father, boom, 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 just randomly just popped up on her screen. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah, right. um, so, I want to delve in a little bit more because I haven't talked about this too much with anyone on, on my channel, but you sure. do talk more about reincarnation and maybe we can demystify some myths about that. Yes. Initially, even after my near-death experience, I didn't want to go there. I didn't want to talk about it too much because I didn't have particular insight about it, but I've done many past life regressions mm. since that time they've been so deeply healing. And what I've found is those, those past lives, generally there's some part of me that can benefit now from that, but I'm, I'm very much living in the present and now. It's like I use that life to heal something I'm working on here and now. Yeah. Uh, what, is your, what are your thoughts on, on the process? Yeah, well, so as you know, because you've researched me and you read my book and so forth, my memories go back a long time. So I started having spontaneously past life memories. I've never done a past life regression myself as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a uh, receiver. Um, but spontaneously in around 1977, I think it was, um, just spontaneously started happening a long, long time ago. And um, I think the meditation had opened me up a lot by then. I've been meditating seven years at that time. Everybody's different. Everybody's unique. But that's what happened with me. Um, and uh, so now my memories go, go back around 6,000 years. Most of the memories I have, the, the 20 to 25 uh, lifetimes that I have various amounts of memories about are mostly within the last uh, 3,000 years, three to 4,000 years. But I agree with you. I tend to look at it, I am living here in the present. I am in Kelvin Chin's body in, in, in 2020, 21st century Earth, living here. And now, um, I use the memories to help lear me learn more about myself, that how can I help myself in this lifetime? Now, so it's all about, to me, that's what, to me, that's how I view life, how I view life is self-knowledge, how do I know myself more, know thyself, that whole thing. And so I use the past life memories to inform myself. And so, for example, the one on the book that I talk about being a Carthaginian slave, where I was... Um, African, I was black, African, uh, captured by the Carthaginians, and I was enslaved, and I was a row, you know, a rower, basically, on one of the warships, and I connected the dots, I, I went, you know, worked backwards, kind of, I call that following the breadcrumbs, I followed the breadcrumbs backwards and figured out it was, I was, it was in a war, war with the Romans, 
probably around 2300 in BC, uh, no, 330 BC, 2300 years ago uh, in the Punic Wars. But the memory that I had was roasting in the sun. That was the initial memory I had was dying, dying alive. Does that make, make sense? Kind of getting burned alive and, and dehydrated on a piece of wreckage of the ship that I, my ship had got blown up and I was holding on to it for I don't know how many days. That's what I remember. So how I've used that today is, to, is when I need inner strength in extreme situations, I've remembered that. So like, for example, I was laid off. I've been laid off five times since I was 50 years old. Now, a lot of 50, 55 year old people, they just crawl up in a ball and they go, what, you know, what, how am I going to, I've had to recreate myself a million times and create, okay, I'm not going to get a different job in a different area, in a different industry, whatever. And I've done that five times. Well, I've drawn from that 2,300 year old memory and just willed myself, <laughs> pulled myself together to do it, you know? Wow. Yeah, no, that's a brilliant example. And I was actually going to ask you to connect a life to that, but that's so helpful to people who are going through that, you know, who are reinventing themselves. And, and it takes a certain childlike innocence almost too to go, okay, you know, life is magical. There are things that you know, can still be learned and uh, there's yeah. a lot to do. But yeah, yeah I, I had, a, I'll be curious. I want to hear about the one from a long time ago. I did one regression where I was an early man and I was, very large, you know, people always want to be like Nefertiti or you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cleopatra, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and uh, I was this huge man and I was a protector of this group of people that lived in a valley below me. And I guess I was just physically strong, almost like a giant. And so I, I didn't marry or anything like I looked over the people and I took care of them. If someone you know, was killing people and I would go fight with them, but I honestly didn't want to. Like my essential nature was like, I loved the cave paintings and I loved to see people happy and dancing. And, and yet because of my size, I was the protector. And so I both killed people and, and, you know, just, you know, protected my people. And that taught me something about why I fight so hard to protect, you know, like my students who are weak or victimized in some way, you know, when they were the junior high students. And that, that kind of healed something within me, you know, that, well, now I live in a different time and there's laws and there's, you know, civilization. Yeah. Yeah. But at that time, that's how I behaved. Right. Yeah. Because that was, that was, was appropriate at that time. And, I, and that's why I have needed to learn this for myself, which is not beating myself up for doing stuff that I would assess now as Kelvin Chin as inappropriate in 21st century culture that I did in whenever, you know, thousand years ago, 4,000 years, whatever, you know, pick a time period that, that was appropriate then. And it, and it was a choice that I made, uh, whether it was culturally appropriate or personally appropriate, whatever, it was a choice that I personally made for various reasons and to not beat myself up about that. You know, that, that's an, and the other point I wanted to point out that you kind of alluded to there um, indirectly is the, that our personality, my experience is that aspects, key fundamental aspects of my personality, just like you were describing your personality, has, has, has persisted, has lasted over millennia, long periods of time. So I think there's something to be learned from that, if we choose to, learn from that about ourselves and, 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 and from these other lifetimes, if they happen to surface. And if they don't happen to surface, that's no big deal, because I think our emotional patterns and these type of deep-seated uh, personality traits that you're referring to, I think those, that, that kind of twofold personality, deep-seated personality trait and the uh, emotional patterns is a way for people who don't have past life memories, you don't need to, but if you look at those two, er those two uh, areas, then I th and, and, and learn more about yourself, I think that's a huge way to tap into the benefit of the past life memories without even having them. Makes a lot of sense, yeah. And there's, there's exponential healing, and I'm very interested in healing, and I've heard people's stories about physical healings. They've done a past life regression around a pain in their hip, and 
found that they were, you know, Dr. Jan Holden told me about how she was a Civil War veteran, lost her leg in that war and felt really bitter about it. And, and that's why she would occasionally have pain in that hip and, and uh, then when the regression took that away. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are stories of people from, uh, for, uh, who have past life memories of losing a leg. And then, and their experience this lifetime with a leg, that leg, their experience about with that leg is very odd. It's just very odd. And then when they have the past life memory, they go, oh, well, that makes sense. You know, my leg got blown off in 18, whenever, 60 in the Civil War or something like that or whatever, you know, it got cut off, right? Amputated. So a lot of things like that. And then just um, scars and uh, birthmarks. So that's very... Uh, 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 it, it's not an uncommon thing, especially with young children who die. And then they may even come back to the same family, young children, two, three, four, five years old, and get re reincarnated back to the same family. And that the, the, the scar that they have in their arm, they have a birthmark, same shape, same exact spot. And oh, by the way, the child likes the same toys, has the same tendencies, et cetera, et cetera, but different physical body. Yeah, all all very interesting and very healing, and, and that's why I do recommend it for people now. You know, the the regressions with the mm. right therapist it, it uh, mm. adds a, a different dimension to to healing. One thing I want to talk about because sure. you know you work in many different organizations. What what is your take on when you've heard near death experiences and your own knowing like? What yeah. uh, have you appreciated from that community and what uh, do you want to you know, talk about more based yeah. on? Well, the IONS group, the International Association for Near-Death Studies, where you and I met when I spoke at their um, international conference in Pennsylvania in, uh, a few months ago, um, great organization. Um, I, you know, I, ha I, I did not talk about this in my book because I didn't want to make my book too much about me. I wanted to have a lot of other people's experiences and stories in there. But I had a near-death experience when I was around 20, but I had already been meditating for two years. So the interesting take on my near-death experience is a little bit different from other people in the sense that, you know how typically when most people, you, 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 you watch on YouTube or I, I'm in a whole bunch of, I'm like oh, 15, different near-death experience Facebook groups or something, some crazy number. And, and, but very often people talk about it, with, and naturally when they first have their near-death experience, it's like, wow, you know, like, you know, I'm on the ceiling or I'm out in space or whatever, whatever the experience is. Um, and for most people, it's their first even out-of-body experience, whereas when I had my near-death experience, I'd have been meditating for two years. I'd already had a, like, I don't know how many out of bodies, and it was like no big deal. So my experience of, to use layperson regular uh, language, my experience of the separation between mind and body was already very, um, it was already familiar to me, I guess. And so when I almost drowned off of, uh, Sandy, off of uh, La Jolla in San Diego, near UCSD in a rip current, I got pulled out in about 30 seconds. I got pulled out almost two miles. Um, my, my sailor friend um, told me it was, I was 1.7 miles out because the 300 foot cliffs were about three or four inches tall. So, um, and I came swimming back in the wrong way and like right against the current, which is not what you do. You're supposed to go in, a, you know, at an angle to the current, but I panicked and I forgot. I was 20 years old and I'm swimming straight back in, I get exhausted. I start going down and I'm like, just in the movies, you know, I'm seeing the surface of the water, I can still, you know, two, two feet above, three feet above my head and I'm starting to go down. And that's when I left my body. And then, and then but, but because I was familiar with the separation of mind and body through the meditation, I willed myself back in. I decided to go back in and, and, and then get back up the surface and take my time and don't rush and blah, blah, blah. So I had a, a, like a different variation on the near-death experience, you know, the expansion and all that stuff. But my, my attitude towards it was different, if that makes sense. Yeah, so that was your, your near-death experiences that coming in and you, you just went right back to your body to send yourself, basically. Yeah, it was quick. It was pretty quick. It was quick, yeah, because obviously I would have drowned if it wasn't quick. But yeah, it, was, it wasn't an extended thing. 
it was it was a pretty quick one and boom boom you know I went ah, okay I could go yeah, I'm gonna go back in okay that's fascinating and I wonder you know if you had been saved and had it been protracted if you would have some point you know disconnected from that body and experienced a lot more yeah. Yeah, you know, who knows? Who, exactly. Who knows? But maybe your meditation, I think people get what they get and what they need. And so maybe your meditation practice, you know, it, it allowed you to save your life, basically. No, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Somebody else, somebody else I mentioned that to, they said that. Yeah, exactly. It probably did in a, in a weird way. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, in my case, I was agnostic and I knew that energy continues on after death, you know, and I, on some level, but I thought it would just dissipate and I'd be part of the grass and it would just be this, you know, I didn't realize that my consciousness would be so strong and even stronger than it is now, you know, because it's not hampered by the body and slowed down by the body. We're constantly thinking about I'm hungry or I'm in pain or, you know, there's exactly. the body. I think you mentioned that takes up a lot of our consciousness. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think so. When people say, either they have an NDE or a spiritually transformative experience where they feel like they're on the other, where they are on the other side and they certainly feel and are, are on the other side. That, 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 that feeling of freedom and that more, almost that at peace, but freedom and power, I think, I think a big part of it is because of what you said. I think we, we forget how much of our psychic, mental, emotional, physical energy is used up, is, 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 is involved in keeping this machine continually operating, you know? Yeah, and you know, in the case of, you know, in my case, uh, my body was badly broken. And so I do deal with physical pain and physical pain takes up a certain amount of Absolutely. consciousness. It's, Absolutely, it, yeah. It's, um, it's interesting, but that gives me hope though that after 20 years of meditation that I think my near-death experience, if I had one now, would be totally different than it was as an agnostic. Because exactly. Would you agree? Like, would yeah, you agree? I think so. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I think so. And, and just in general, I mean, I have a look back this lifetime. I've been meditating for 50 years. This is my 50th year meditating. And so if I just look back, forget about my meditation. Just look back at my overall life experience. So my, my, my waking, dreaming, and sleeping. So my sleep experience is totally different from what, and like, I, I don't know sometimes if I am asleep or not, if that makes sense. So I am wide awake. I'm not dreaming. I'm not having dreams. So in my dreams, my dreams are always lucid. They have been for some decades now. So I'm very clear and I can do things in my dream and control things over that, that lucid kind of dreaming that a lot of people have had. But when I'm talking about something different, where my sleeping, I am wide awake, not wide awake, but my, I, my, my awareness is, is there. And yet I am not aware of anything at the same time until I am aware of something. And when I am aware of something, I realize that I have been, there was wakefulness, if that makes sense, before I had that awareness of something. And so um, that's an experience that's become normal for me for a long time now, for many years now. But to your point, you know, earlier on, it wasn't. It was like, come and go, come and go, come and go, come and go. Now it's just, it's just the way it is. So I, so I think analogously, you know, we, um, we all, each of us in our own way, can develop this more um, fluid, more uh, familiar, more almost permanent, everyday uh, connection within ourselves with our, our underlying consciousness, what I sometimes refer to as the essential me, because the essential me is what's eternal, not not Kelvin Chin. Kelvin Chin's going to go away. And, but, but there's something that's more essential than Kelvin Chin or Carthaginian slave or the whatever, you know, that is, I think, eternal. And I want to bring this down, this conversation down <laughs> a little, drill it down to yeah. the idea of um, people who are afraid of dying. And yeah. I know that you've helped a lot of people who fear death. And I love how you break it down and 
if you don't mind just kind of sharing sure. your basic points of how you give comfort to people who do fear sure. the process. Sure. So, so I, uh, uh, one segment of my nonprofit work, separate from the meditation, but it, there's some overlap, but um, is over, helping people overcoming the fear of death. So I have a, a, a nonprofit called Overcoming the Fear of Death. And um, basically, um, it started when my mom died real quickly, because my mom died when I was young, she was young, and that kind of blew me away. And so I started helping people because it was helping me. I started talking with other people about it because it was helping me. And so it was mutually beneficial. And then I, 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 I realized that people would argue about religious and cultural beliefs about death. So I thought, this is, this is dumb. How can we talk more about it, uh, about it more openly and, 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 and you know, talk about the elephant in the room that's supposed to shun it? And so I came up with the four beliefs, which is uh, simply this, the, the scientific belief, these beliefs underlie all the religious and cultural beliefs in the world. So that way I could talk to anybody about it and they can talk to anybody else about it just through these four belief lenses. One is the science belief, my dad's belief, which is that's it, one life. No, no, no spirit, soul, mind doesn't continue. That's it. Brain dies, mind dies. Um, second belief, I call it the fear of continued existence. They believe in an afterlife, but there's some fear and the fear could be of many, many different things, whatever. Uh, depending on culture and religion and so forth. Third belief system is belief in an afterlife, no fear, maybe even looking forward to it, but they think that you just go there and you go to wherever, heaven, wherever, that's it. Fourth belief system, reincarnation. So the fourth, past lives, future lives, you can get reincarnated if you want to, et cetera, et cetera. That's, those are the four beliefs. Everybody on the planet falls somewhere there or they might be a hybrid, they could be fence sitters. And so I help people. The first thing I do to answer your question is, I help people, I, I don't tell them what my beliefs are. They, they, if they really ask me, I'll tell them, but I don't go there because it's all about helping them. So I ask them what their belief is. And then depending on where they are, I go through that one of those four lenses and then we talk about it. And so um, that, that's ba the basic approach. But uh, the first step usually is clarifying for them what their belief is because a lot of times people may be clear on it sometimes they're not clear sometimes they're a fence sitter like a hybrid um and then we talk about that um other people think they know what their belief is and then they describe their fear to me and i say no no actually you're not fully that belief you're actually a mixture so that so we identify which which belief system then we can apply the solution hmm this kind of naturally leads me to a couple of different questions, but one was, you said this in a video, you said kind of be wary of any near death experience or who comes back as if they have all the knowledge and this uh, is the way that things should be, you know, that they're agenda driven. And I think that, yeah, there probably are some people who come back and they're like, I have all the answers, <laughs> you know, I was granted all the answers over there. And yet they're still filtering it through their belief system, their culture, their experiences. If they say it is this one way, then they're not perhaps being open-minded enough to, to really teach people from many different lenses. And could you clarify that a bit more? Yeah, so, I mean, if somebody is really adamant and they say, this is the way, blah, 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 I'm not here to change their mind about it. I'm just saying, when I was saying on the, the video that you were watching of me, I was probably just pointing out that just that's an in, your antenna goes up. That, that's a red flag. So then just you want to filter whatever. When you hear somebody say, oh, my way is the only way, then you want to start filtering what other stuff that they're saying. That's all I was saying. But I'm not going to change somebody from thinking that. That's their thinking. That's okay. We live in a free will universe. And, and the first thing, you know, I just did a very intensive uh, weekend, uh, uh, 16 hours in two days with, with a group of people in Florida. And the thing is, I, first thing I said, and I said it repeatedly to remind them, is that, look, you take what I'm saying and you take what is useful for you. You shelve the stuff that doesn't make sense or is not appropriate right now. And if stuff is, some stuff is really against what you've, what your, your, your comfort zone is, then you, sh you sh throw it away. So you take what I encourage people to think more clearly for themselves. So I'm, my whole thing in my teaching is to teach people approaches and ideas 
and sure, I'm going to talk to them about my experience, but it's my experience, not theirs. So I only teach from my, give them my experiences to give them data. I call them data points for them to, to, to think about so that maybe it inspires or stimulates something in them so they get their own data point. But, that, but I'm not tell, telling them my experience because they got to fully buy it, you know? Right. And I, I love that so much because when I wrote my book, I knew very clearly that I love literature and I love memoirs. And I know that you're writing one and it's a different experience to write a memoir because you're human and you're going to talk about some of your mistakes and, you know, your humanness. Right. And uh, one of the things that cracks me up is people will judge me. Well, she had a near death experience and then she did this, you know, like, oh, that's terrible. And I laugh and I was like, that's why I wrote the book. You know? <laughs> <Hello>. <laughs> you know? <laughs> to remind you that you're still human. <laughs> you, know, exactly. that you can have this magical, mystical experience and you don't have all the answers and, you know, kind of be wary of anybody for any reason, near death experience or not, who has all the answers. <laughs> right. There's this phenomenon in, 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 amongst minds, we'll call them, because I don't think it's just an earth thing. I've, I have memory living on other planets too. Um, and I, me I have memory being a woman on this planet and so forth. So I have a lot of different memories. But so I don't think it's gender driven. I don't think it's earth driven even. But there's a phenomenon I call the importance of being important. And so the, I think you're describing somebody who felt for some reason that they felt that you were all of a sudden becoming more important than them. So they had to put you down some way. And so that the importance of being important, like, supersedes everything it's that's how important it is you know that's funny yeah <laughs> yeah instead of just sharing life and yeah, you know exactly. sharing <laughs> exactly. yeah. yeah and uh i do want to ask you some questions i know that at the ians sure. conference you met my boyfriend who yes. he's had an out-of-body experience and even though he's had that experience yes. he struggles still with a fear of death and he had some specific questions for you sure. and i wanted to take someone else's questions because I think it's probably similar to things you get from people in workshops. But mm. number one, his single biggest fear is he says, when I, I fear that when I die, I'll lose all consciousness and connection to those that I love in this world. And I'll never see be connected with my two kids. Again, this terrifies me. I can't shake it. And these thoughts overwhelm me. Why do I have this particular fear and how do I overcome this fear of that part of dying? Yeah. So first of all, when people ask me a question that's like this, uh, a similar question to this, I, first, I, first of all, I point out to them that th this is not a fear of death. This is a fear, a related fear about death. So it's not a, a fear about your own death. It's a fear about losing loved ones. And so what does that mean? That ha that, that's, a, it, that's what sometimes people call the fear of missing out, in a sense, you know, is a fear of missing out, of engaging with his loved ones, and he won't be with them anymore. And so um, what does that mean? That means that we need to be more with our loved ones now, obviously, and enjoy being with them as much as possible. Um, there's a, the solution for that. Um, I have found the best solution is, is uh, well, first of all, I don't do therapy with people. I'm not a therapist. <laughs> I'm not a doctor. You know, <laughs> I am a teacher. But, um, but the right. thing is, um, so not doing therapy with people, a therapy may be helpful for people. So I get referrals from therapists, et cetera, et cetera, and I refer people to therapy. But the solution that I provide for people who have this kind of fear is I, is I teach them to meditate. Because the meditation technique that I teach is not a guided meditation, and it's very easy. There's no focus and controlling. You're not clearing the mind. So first of all, it's what it's going to do, because it's so easy, it's going to flip on the parasympathetic nervous system very, very quickly which is in layperson's term, the parasympathetic nervous system is the medical term. The layperson's term for that is the opposite of the fight or flight switch. Well, if we can turn on the opposite of the fight or flight switch, what does that do? That does a number of things, but essentially what it does is it balances out our biochemistry, our brain and our blood chemistry, cortisol level. There's 40 to 60 different hormones and chemicals. Depending on which endocrinologist you talk to, they stop counting at different points. But there's a whole ton of them, okay? And so um, here's the thing. The other element of that, the other, so, the other benefit is not only the neurophysiologic, but it's expanding the conscious capacity of the mind. And so if we can expand the conscious capacity of the mind, get out of what 
I call the eight inch plastic bucket. So this psychology professor year, decades ago said, you know, our people incorrectly think their mind is limited to that. No, their mind is vast, it's huge. Well, uh, the technique that I teach is so easy that it gets the mind expanded in this way consciously very, very quickly. Well, what does that do? That increases the inner strength, the confidence and so forth so that we become impervious to fear. So fears tend to drop away because fears are limiting. They're limiting factors and fears arise, why? Fears arise because we think we are limited. Well, when you experience yourself as, un, as, as, as more or less unlimited and you don't have the cortisol levels uh, you know, dampening everything, then that's when the fears can dissipate. And so that's the, that's the simple solution I would suggest. You know. I love that. And love is the opposite of fear to me, you know, that there was yeah. just fear and love on the other side. And my, my answer to him has always been, you're connected to those you love, you know, both from this life and other lifetimes and people who've already passed on that connection will be instant and that right. love will continue on. That bond will definitely continue. But the, and, but the thing is, thing is, He's not experiencing that now, and that's the trouble. So, so, so the rubber meets the road. Uh, while, while everything you're saying is accurate and true intellectually, what, what, what he needs is an experience of himself as more vast than he is to start experiencing the reality of those intellectual words. Because until he has, it's just, they're just words. You know, people can read those in the books, you know, we, in, in, in workshops and so forth. But that's the missing link, I call that. The missing link is that turning within and allowing ourselves to experience ourselves in this more expanded way. I'm glad you said that because I think he gets frustrated with me. And he's like, well, you already know what it's like exactly. over there. So it's going to be easy for you. I know you'll find me. Right. <laughs> right. He's right. like, but will my kids find me? Will I find them? Will exactly. I, you know, ex so, so, and I... It's, it's, it's like I tell people, we, what, we, what you're doing and what many of us do, we describe point B, but he, Michael's at point A. So how do we get from A to B? That's the thing. So that's what I do with people. I get them from point A to point B. That's what I know how to do. And so he has many things can just, we can describe point B. If everybody's at point B, then nobody had any problems. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's great. So his next question, and it's yeah. maybe along the same lines, but it's, yeah. Despite having a powerful in, um, out of body experience in '84, despite my firm belief in God and Jesus and that I'll have an existence after death, there is still a tiny part of me that fears I will just cease to be. It causes me to bolt upright in bed and shoot across the room in fear and panic. Why do I have this fear? Yeah. And so how I do I overcome it? Right. So I call this the fear of uncertainty. And if we want to distill all fears down, we could distill all fears down to the fear of uncertainty. And certainly we could distill the fear of death down to the fear of uncertainty. Because I, I would say to him, yeah, everybody, I say, I say to all, almost all my, my, my clients who come with me with fears of death, I say, look, we'll, nobody knows till they know. We're all going to know when we know. When's that going to be? That's going to be at that most intimate moment. I call it the most intimate moment of our lives when we physically die, when we physically shut off, that most intimate moment, one of two things is going to happen. It's binary, black and white. Either mine's going to continue or it's not. If it doesn't, everything's moot, irrelevant. If it does continue, I want to help prepare you to live more fully now, more happily, more confident, fear-free now with Tricia, with whoever else, children, etc. Plus, the continual presence, always changing, your now then is going to be at your moment of death. So I'm preparing people for that moment now, but helping them live more fully now with their loved ones to his first question, and then preparing them for that moment of uh, uncertainty when he'll know by getting rid of the fear. So I can't get rid of the uncertainty. We live in a free will universe. It's full of uncertainty. I can get, help people get rid of the fear. Yes, that's great. And it's, it's interesting that, you know, you mentioned your own near death experience and how that was different because of meditation and out of body experiences. I was in a plane that was going down and, you know, we're prepared for a crash landing and I was pretty certain at the speed we we're falling that we we're going to die. Wow. And I was totally at peace. 
yeah. total piece because I was like, this is a good way to go. <laughs> this is going to be instant. <laughs> <It's quick. Yeah. laughs> this is not going to be painful. This is not, you know, a year and I see you. This is like, I'll probably yeah. be out of body before it even hits the ground. That's you know? exactly <laughs> right. You, you would leave the body before impact. That's right. That's what would and, happen. Yeah. And so I was at peace with it and the people around me were freaking out and I was trying to get them to pray and focus on God. And, and uh, yet another time I was choking. And you know, that, that animal panic came up and I was like, oh, this is painful, I don't like this. And so there is that element of dying that is physically scary and physically painful. Yeah. And I think we do have to just kind of honor that. Yeah, and, and I think the pain and suffering fear, which is another fear that can come up, that's a related fear, it's not the fear of death. Again, it, it's part of that, and I'm, that's, that's my second book, which I'm working and trying to finish right now. But uh, I talk about this one in there which is, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's really about experiencing the separation of the mind and the body to, to get over that fear and so forth. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's very real, it's very important, it's a very common, and so common, yeah. And then his final question is, as a believer, I know that I'm forgiven from my past, future sins and transgressions, but part of my fear of death is that I'll be punished, even mm. though I know God is love and that love is all we take with us. Why do I have that fear? Yeah, well, who, do, who, know, who knows why he has it? Because it could be from this lifetime, childhood thing. It could be from another lifetime. I, uh, who knows? But, but how do we get rid of it? And, and first of all, I tell people when they're worried about the punishment thing after they die. First of all, I tell them, um, if you believe in God, and he said he, he believes in God, so because I, I work with a lot of people who don't, but um, who, or some people who don't, but, but um, I ask people where they're at with that first. And I say, well, if you believe in God or the universe or some whatever, and you're worried about punishment, Whoever is doing the, that punishment or the God, we must assume that God is at least as smart as human being. And everybody will agree to that, I think. And I say, oh, we would probably hope that God is a lot smarter than human beings. Everybody <laughs>, laughs. Everybody agrees with that. I said, okay. But so we as human beings, we already know there are hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of psychosociological studies done showing that punishment does not change behavior. So if, 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 if God's purpose to punish people is not to change behavior, then what is it? Then, oh, just to uh, be, because he likes to see people suffer? Well, if that's the case, he, she, or it, that's not a God that I want to hang around with or, you know, be, you know, be associated with. So see you later. But so, so, so it makes no logical sense that God would structurally create a place, never mind an eternal place, of, of punishment. Um, so, so my thing is, um, uh, it's it, to help people release from that, number one, intellectually, by pointing those intellectual understanding points out to them. And then secondarily, um, have them meditate, turn within, and re get rid of their cortisol levels and so forth and so on, because I guarantee you, if people are having that level of fear, their cortisol, if they went to the doctor and got their blood tested and their cortisol levels measured, it'd be very, very high. And in fact, I have had people come to me and call me and say, and they, I said, oh yeah, I just came from my doctor and that's why I'm calling you because my doctor told me that I need to learn to meditate because my cortisol levels are too high. I said, exactly. So, and in, in, in the experiments that I was in, I was the first, I was in the first medical studies ever done in the United States on meditation, 1971. I was a test, one of the several, you know, many test subjects in it. And they were taking blood samples before, during, and after, and they noticed cortisol level, lactic acid, and other parameters plummeting in the blood chemistry. Well, you can't make that up. You may feel like you're calmer after you meditate, uh, but if your meditation is changing your blood chemistry, something real is going on. And so that is the other component that I suggest to get rid of that fear as well. Yeah, I, I agree that fear gets in the way of a lot of that spiritual knowing. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people save that spiritual connection for just Sunday at church. And you yes. know, like, 
I'll see that change yeah. in him, you know, that, that calm, that peace. And I think, yeah, but you can have that every day if yes. you meditate, you yes. know, you really can have that experience of just greater peace through well, something as simple as meditation. Here's what I tell people. I say, look, everybody in the planet, 7.6 billion people on planet earth now, humans. So, so everybody on the planet is going through waking, dreaming, and sleeping on a regular basis. And the sleeping somewhat rejuvenates them and the dreaming and so forth. Okay, fine. If that was enough, nobody would be walking around planet Earth stressed out. And everybody is. What's that tell you? That says that it's not enough, that there's something missing. That's why the, with the meditation, when you, when you interject amongst the waking, dreaming, and sleeping, this different style of neurophysiologic functioning that's changing the cortisol levels and the adrenaline and the lactic acid levels and carpal levels and blah, 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 that you're sleeping and dreaming or not, that's, that's what, it's got to be part of people's regular routine, not every once in a while, but consistently, because the consistency is what develops the familiarity in the neurophysiology, and that's what will expand the conscious capacity for experience from a spiritual mental standpoint and which will allow the inner confidence to blossom and then the groundedness and centeredness to really get established and not easily washed away. Because some people, you can come and go and feel that way, but it comes and goes. And you want it to not be fleeting. You want it to be constant. You want it to be the norm. And that's just, so people sleep regularly. So why not meditate regularly? Brush your teeth regularly. Why not meditate regularly? No? <laughs> right. And yeah. I encourage near-death experiencers who, you know, all of this is new to them to try out different meditation practices because oh. it can expand their knowing and it can certainly add layers to that. I mean, I started having lucid dreams and yes. out-of-body experiences because I was meditating after my near-death experience. And not only that, but I have, um, there's a, I have 100 testimonials on my website each of the websites, but one of them is from uh, uh, Fritz Mueller, who uh, uh, had four NDEs, traumatic NDEs. He was left after his NDEs petrified. So they were traumatic. They did not alleviate his fears. They exacerbated his fears. So I worked with him and he's fear free now, but he, his NDEs were traumatic for him. So not everybody comes out of their NDEs feeling, oh, I have no fear of death. I feel so great, blah, blah, blah. A lot of people do. And those are the, tend to be the more vocal ones. You, the, the vocal, you, you don't hear a lot of vocal traumatic NDE people, but they're out there. And he, he was one of them. Interesting. And, you know, I've tried, I'm curious about your practice now and, and what you teach people. I've tried Joe Dispenza's workshops and, uh, you know, studied transcendental meditation. I came up with my own right off the yeah. bat, you know, just my way of connecting yeah. and yeah. my way of getting out of body. I often go to the light of God because that was my favorite part of the near death experience. And that yeah. kind of wipes away a lot of, of that pain. But but it is important to teach people who don't have that experience. And I'm kind of curious, um, you know, if you want to tell me more about what you teach. Yeah, what I teach. So first of all, my history is I learned TM in 1970, Transcendental Meditation. I, and I studied personally with Maharishi in 1971 and 73. For a, a number of months, I, was study, I studied with him. And then I became a TM teacher. And I taught with his organization for about 10 years. I was an international leader in, in his organization. Uh, for about 10 years. Um, taught the first meditation courses ever in the history of West Point Military Academy. Taught several, a couple of hundred people, few hundred people there. Uh, and then in Korea, on all the U.S. Army bases and in the, in the uh, Air Force bases, I was up in the D DMZ teaching six, eight, ten times. So, um, and in companies and so forth. And I've continued to teach meditation, but I moved away from that organization because they started going off in different direction from the way um, I, I wanted to, to go. But then since then, I've removed all the culture and religious trappings from the teaching, and I've made the technique even easier. So I've made it even easier, much, even more flexible, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you and I could talk offline about you know, what, you know, what, how, what I could do to help tweak your, your, your practice. But um, I've 
taught people who've done TM before. I've taught people who've done Vedant meditation, Buddhist. I've taught Buddhist monks my technique. And they still do their Buddhist meditation all day in their monastery. Wow. And so there's no, there's no conflict. I'm an inclusive guy, not an exclusive guy. So they still do theirs and my, And I say do mine first because it's non-content oriented. And they all say, yeah, it's so much easier. And they do it. And then they do their Buddhist meditation in their monastery afterwards. And they, get, they, they all come back and tell me, oh, I get so much more out of it. Thank you so much. So I've taught right. Chris, Christian you know, priests, nuns, you name it. So, um, and they still do their other thing, right? Their contemplative prayer meditations, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but the thing is, it's it, it, any process, I tell people in all of my public lectures, you know, whether you do my technique or any other technique, you want to do a turning within technique that's as easy and comfortable as possible. You want it as easy and effortless as possible. Why? Because that's going to more quickly turn on the parasympathetic nervous system. Why? Because the, the parasympathetic nervous system is an automatic switch, just like the fight or flight, which everybody knows is the opposite. It's the sympathetic nervous system. The fight or flight is an automatic switch. You don't decide to turn it on. You know, you, you know you're crossing the street and somebody runs a red light. You know, you, you run away out of the car, out of, out of the car, out of the way of the car. You just, you don't turn on. I got to turn on my fight or flight now. I better get to the curb. No, it's just boom. Well, the opposite switch is equally automatic. So the more automatic the meditation technique, the quicker it's going to turn on the automatic parasympathetic. So whatever the technique is, you want it to be as automatic as possible. No focus, no control, no clearing of the mind. All of that is, is a, mis, uh, a mis, misunderstanding about how the mind operates. Because people have taken waking state rules and they've pushed waking state rules into the meditation realm and it's not meditation is not the same as waking state so don't apply waking state rules don't apply focusing and i think we will end here with if you want to give anyone a specific technique i think you were talking to me before we started yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll you know obviously i can't teach the, the i teach a four-day class for about an hour and a half each day the, the technique that I teach, but I can leave everybody with this simple technique and I'll give you the brief version of it, which is very, very simple. It's just putting your hand on your tummy and then you put your hand on your tummy. It doesn't matter which hand, it doesn't matter the exact position, but anywhere on your tummy and you just take three, four, five, six, eight, ten deep, deep breaths. That's all you do through your mouth. Take some Deep breaths and all that, you can do it with your eyes closed, eyes open, doesn't matter. The beauty of this simple technique is it calms you. That's what it does. And what it's doing is it's turning on the vagus nerve. It switches, it's one of the many ways, there are several ways to turn on the vagus nerve. This is one of them. And, it's, and you can Google it, V-A-G-U-S. The vagus nerves goes through the base of the medulla, the base of your brain goes through, it's the longest nerve in your body, goes through all your vital organs. And it just calms everything down it turns on the parasympathetic temporarily. Um, it's, so it's a temporary, an immediate fix, but temporary fix. Whereas what I teach, the, the eyes closed technique I teach is, is more permanent. But this is a good quick fix. I teach people to do this all the time. And pe you can do it in a conference room. You can do it. I teach kindergarten kids. It doesn't matter. You can do it in public. Nobody knows what you're doing. And the eyes closed, eyes open as many times as you want. And um, I taught my son, you know, what, 27 years ago when he was in kindergarten, you know, and um, he, he was great. I said, think about how much daddy loves you. Put your hand in your tummy and just take some deep breaths. And he was fine, you know. So it's a very, very simple technique. It's grounding and so forth. I taught somebody recently and, um, and he, he, I didn't know where he was. I thought he was at home. The next day he told me he was sitting in his car, in his car outside the emergency room of his city hospital, ready to check himself in, but he figured he'd call me first. And he, he, he texted me, called me, and then I taught him this. He went home and he slept like a baby. So two, two quick questions and then I'll end this. But yeah. one is my intuitive no knowing tells me to go to nature if it's a beautiful day outside and meditate there, that there's something about the earth and I will I'll begin and I'll say, okay, please, earth, take my fear and give me greater freedom. Give me, you know, take my anger, give me compassion for every person. You know, like I'll just let go of every negative emotion and replace it. And I feel like the earth 
grants me that, you know, it, it takes my de- negativity and gives me actual positivity. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? So my thought on that is that bottom line, I'm a pragmatist. So whatever works, I applaud. I am not a my way or the highway guy. So if that works for you, Tricia, then, then, then that's great. Then you should continue to do it if it works. And so who knows why it works for you and it doesn't work for somebody else. You know what I mean? There's something about the wiring of you. Who knows? It could be a past life memory that, you know, experience where you, you that's what you did for, the, you know, for 50 years in another lifetime every day. Who knows? We don't know. But the bottom line is pra- pra- pragmatic approach I take. If it works, great, you know? Yeah, makes sense. And then um, there was one more question I was going to ask. Oh, yes, just when you encounter people who've had extreme trauma, so they've lived in war-torn areas, um, I'm sure you've come across people who have extreme levels of trauma. What's your advice to them? Oh, I work with people with PTSD. I work with uh, Iraq war vets, uh, Afghanistan now, um, vets. um, and I, I told you, I taught in the Army, uh, you know, in, in, in Korea and in uh, the Air, U.S. Air Force and so forth. So uh, a lot of trauma, and including family members, Gold Star families. I've worked with some Gold Star families. So my advice to them, I teach them this simple technique, first of all, since they have a quick technique, hand in the tummy, take some deep breaths, very, very simple, turns on their vagus nerve. But then, then, then I... I um, so my approach with that, those folks like that, I teach them the, tech, the meditation technique that I teach, the eyes closed techniques, 10, 15 minutes, twice a day they do. It doesn't take a long time. So then they have a tool that they're doing on their own because I'm all about arming people to be independent, right? Uh, self-sufficient, in other words. But the other component that I bring in, if somebody is coming out of a war-torn situation, or who knows, very traumatic like that, they've experienced a lot of grief. And so then I work with them on a grieving with, in my grief recovery work. So that's a different approach from my death and dying. It kind of overlaps sometimes uh, in, in different ways, but there's a specific grief program. And I talk about how grieving is not just sadness. It's about conflicting feelings. And so let's work through some of these conflicting feelings and so forth. Not from a psychotherapist standpoint, but from a from a, I, I teach them certain principles and so forth and how to look at that. And then, um, and many of them have their own psychotherapists on the side as well. So that, that's kind of my PTSD-ish kind of approach. Um, but the first, look, I have, a, I have a, uh, uh, an army vet, uh, paratrooper. I don't want to name names, but you might be able to connect the dots if you go in, on my website and, and, and uh, and read some of the testimonials. Sometimes people just put their first name because they want to be more anonymous. But, but um, this person um, just learned my meditation technique and her PTSD went away. So it depends on the person, you know, it, how they're wired and what the need is, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, I love that. And I, I talk with people who both have, have been veterans, but and people who are leaving countries where they've experienced a lot of trauma. Yes. And so there's, there's that element too of the unknown and that level of... Yeah, uh, just as an immig- immigrant from that country. Yeah, immigrating. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it, it helps everyone. And I guess that's the point is meditation can reach everyone no matter their level of trauma. Yes, absolutely. And then the grieving process is also part of somebody immigrating from a country because that, that's a loss. It's a huge loss. They're losing their friends, their familiarity with their country, their culture, and their going to a new country huge grieving process there yeah yeah that's something that i talk about with students too that you can love where you immigrate to but you'll always feel a part of where you left and so it's this part of yourself that is that is lost yes absolutely yep Yeah. well fascinating i feel like i could talk to you forever but we do have to (laughs) close this at some point and uh if you want to learn more about uh Kelvin, you can certainly check out his book, Overcoming the Fear of Death, and I'll have all of our links below. And thank you for your support of my book and your interest in poetry as well. That, that really kind of touched my heart. But thank you, Kelvin, for your time. Great. Great being here with you, Tricia. Thank you so much.